Uh, today we're going to be talking about intro to generative audio. Um, this kind of deviates from what we've been talking about before, um, but we're going to kind of tie it into the different kinds of models that we've been talking about, um, as well as how they can be used for um, generative audio. Um, this lesson will first dive into some signal theory um, and then move on into things that we're more familiar with, things like deconvolutions and using transformers for next note prediction. Um, hope you guys enjoy. Yeah, so we're going to start with a soft introduction to digital signals, um, then go into some geometric signal theory um, and with transformers and finally how, how we can kind of generate sounds using these. So the first thing we want to talk about is how can we sample and quantize a continuous time signal, right? Um, something that's unique about music and audio in general is how um, how continuous it is, right? Um, when you listen to like a violin play or a piano play, this is a continuous signal that you're taking in and you're, you're processing, um, which is not very easy for a computer to do, given that um, every operation needs to be um, in, on a continuous time signal. Um, the way that we, we can fix that is through the process of discretization or to, to make a, uh, an analog signal, a digital signal for us to be able to process. Um, the result of sampling is essentially taking um, a, a continuous time signal um, and discretizing it by a certain sampling rate. Um, the two kind of main ways that we can make our signal easier to process is one, by taking samples at certain time periods, and two, by quantizing our levels. So instead of dealing with a continuous scale, we can quantize at certain levels, for example, a frequency of like two, four, six, eight hertz. Um, what this allows us to do is come up with discrete points, um, as you can see here. Um, our analog signal is, is quantized and broken up into certain regions on the uh, I guess you could say the y-axis, um, in this case, um, applied over a time axis. Um, in the other uh, hand, we can sample at certain rates. Um, that gives us a time discrete signal. Combining the time discrete signal and the quantized signal gets us our digital signal, where we have a certain sampling period, so we know how far along um, the uh, kind of time axis our measurements are. And we know that our measurements are something that our computer can understand because they're quantized, right? Um, this ensures that we have a numeric representation of the signal um, and greatly limits the amount of information that we need to process, which is incredibly useful for any type of audio processing application. Um, the next thing we're going to kind of talk about is changing forms, right? If we want to go from analog to digital, if we want to go from digital back to analog, um, what are the kinds of ways that we can do this? Um, so the analog to digital converter um, uses something called the sample and hold circuit, um, the details of which aren't incredibly important. Um, if you guys do want to learn more about um, DAX and ADCs, um, you can take 16B as well as um, signals classes at Berkeley. I'd highly recommend those. Um, and ADC converts an analog input to a digital output, um, whereas a digital to analog converter converts a digital signal to an analog output. Um, we can kind of start by talking about the ADC circuit. Um, so this uses something called the SARS ADC algorithm. Um, essentially what this is, is a binary search to figure out what is my best digital approximation of my analog signal, right? So I have a continuous signal, pass it through um, my sample and hold circuit, um, which is an actual circuit um, that, that you can, you can Google. Um, but essentially um, what we do after this step is where we've quantized the signal in some way, shape or form. So we don't have fully continuous values that we're passing into our SARS ADC um, algorithm. Um, and then from here, we take in our, our input and our output is um, a discretized form um, based on the amount of bits of precision that we want to have. So depending on whether we want a two bit approximation, a three bit approximation, this highly depends on both the level of precision that we want, the uh, constraints on our computing power, as well as the initial form that we're trying to process. Um, the digital to analog converter um, is kind of the opposite, um, except here we use a low pass filter, um, which is also covered in courses like 16B. Um, the motivation behind this is that um, we, we maintain a signal um, that's the pass band where we allow every signal to pass. When we hit a certain cutoff frequency, um, we wane our signal by um, a certain uh, factor. Um, and that factor um, dictates the slope of this line and our signal will continuously wane after uh, that cutoff frequency is hit. 
Um, on the right is kind of the picture of the approximation um, where we can uh, approximate uh, different uh, quantization levels, different bit uh, parities based on the, uh, the SARS ADC algorithm. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is quantization levels, right? How many bits do we want to use to approximate a certain signal? And the level of quantization here um, correlates very directly to the dynamic range of the signal that you're quantizing. Um, we know that sampling rate is measured in Hertz. This is covered in classes like physics, things like that, um, where our, the frequency is one over our, our sampling period in Hertz. Um, the quantization level, uh, as we know, is measured in bits, right? So if we, if we have two bits, these are the uh, kinds of bins that we can put our signal into. Um, if we have three bits, we have a lot more precision. Uh, we increase the amount of information that we have. Um, you can you can see this here, um, where you have a, a sample value, which is your initial uh, kind of wave, a quantization value, which is the, the quantized wave. Um, and you can see how the quantized wave becomes a better and better approximation. And our error value, which is the green, um, becomes smaller and smaller as our bit depth increases, right? So with a bit depth of two, our approximation isn't very great. With a bit depth of three, um, it's definitely getting better. Our errors reduce significantly and our quantization is uh, a lot more indicative of our sample. Bit depth of five, we're really adhering to our, our curve. Now our error is almost zero. And a bit depth of 16, you have an almost perfect approximation. Um, there is a trade-off though. The trade-off is compute power. Um, how much time do you have to process this? If this is something where, for example, a lot of musicians, um, they want to sample their voice and pitch it up very fast, right? What quantization level do we do we want there? Do we want a lossless pitch up that takes an hour to compute? Or if we could do something in five to 10 minutes that is a little bit lossy, but not enough for the human ear to really comprehend. Um, is that something that we are satisfied with? Or um, an interesting, uh, uh, proposition could be can we do a lossy pitch up with a uh with by filling in the blanks um in some intelligent way um through prediction um or uh kind of note fitting um which is an interesting consideration um i think given the fact that um audio is a a continuous time signal um the districtization process and the choices you make matter a lot um and because of that this field is so interesting and there's a lot of really didactic work around um, how we can take these continuous signals, discretize them, run some sort of algorithm on them, um, and then recontinuize them so that um, the user can can listen to to the byproduct. Um, this is a very interesting uh, theory, um, the the Shannon Newquist sampling theorem, um, and this this is involved with um, a whole bunch of things in digital signal processing. Um, as well as really anything that you're getting a, a signal from and are sampling at a certain rate, which in industry is is almost every signal you're going to encounter. Um, so we know a signal can be reconstructed from its samples without loss of information if and only if the original signal has no frequencies above one half of the sampling frequency. So our sampling frequency has to be uh, greater than or equal to uh, two times whatever frequency we're trying to process. If the sampling frequency is less than double of the highest frequency, present, aliasing will happen. Um, this asserts that you need at least two samples per period. Um, the aliasing phenomenon is incredibly interesting. This happens both visually and um, auditorily, um, and aliasing is an entire um, topic just based on itself. Um, as you can see here, your approximation gets very different as your, your sampling rate increases and decreases. If your sampling rate is 0.3 hertz, um, you can see that the x-axis is uh, the uh, pointer angle um, in degrees. Um, and as, as your sampling rate increases, your approximation to this polynomial um, also increases. Where at one hertz, you're almost perfectly fitting the polynomial on the, the points. Um, something interesting to consider is that at a sampling rate of, of 0.3, you are fitting a polynomial, right? Because you're, you're creating a polynomial through the points that you have. However, this polynomial is very not indicative of uh, kind of the actual signal that you're trying to process, right? While we, we can see that this, this does kind of capture the trends of our data in that it, it falls when our data has fallen, it rises when our data has risen. Um, this is a pretty bad approximation by all accounts. You can see here the, the actual um, 
motivation behind uh, the uh, the Nyquist rate, right? At a continuous sinusoidal signal, um, this is our original signal, above the Nyquist rate, um, you can see that we have uh, the, I guess you could say the x-axis um, uh, collisions, as well as our, our peaks and our dips. Um, so this gives us like very discretized information um, because we're, we're oversampling, right? Um, the undersampled case is we have samples at certain points along this, this axis, um, given that we're taking samples at a, a certain rate that is uh, less than double of the highest frequency. Um, so this is an example of where aliasing would be present. At the Nyquist rate, so exactly at um, double the highest frequency, you can see we have an approximation that kind of captures uh, this this trend. If you fit all of these points, you get a wave that is is waning and uh, and rising at different points. Um, so above the Nyquist rate, you have like a very very strict approximation of the points at the Nyquist rate. You're able to sample um, certain points without losing too much information, as in the undersampled case. Um, so this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, kind of talking. Briefly, a little bit more about aliasing. Aliasing is the byproduct of poor sampling, right? So a lower wave resolution will result in a modified output signal as compared to the original input that we're, we're trying to process. Um, we can see if this is our original input wave, um, different frequencies approximate our input wave differently, right? This wave you wouldn't really think is indicative of uh, the actual wave um, that we're, we're trying to process. This wave is, one could argue, uh, even less indicative. Um, we're, we're skipping a lot of points through our interpolation. Um, and this wave is, is the byproduct of a lot of, of aliasing, right? Where we have a curve that is not representative of our, our sample at all um, because we're sampling at a rate that is, uh, is not adhering to our, our aliasing uh, law. Um, so frequencies that are higher than one half of the sampling rate will be automatically transformed to lower frequencies. That's where information loss stems from. We take um, our, our low frequency um, and that becomes um, a product from taking our original frequency that's above um, half of the sampling rate and subtracting half of the sampling rate from it. So essentially you can think of it as downsampling and contributing to information loss um, by transforming uh, higher signals into uh, lower frequencies. So yeah, there's a, a lot of literature about um, aliasing effects, um, including spatial aliasing, right? Um, you see that uh, there's there's a lot of different ways that aliasing takes place. Um, this is an original image. If we do point sampling, um, where we, we take certain points along this, um, you can see that the image changes. We get kind of the gist of this, um, but this is a, a compressed image. It contains similar information. It allows us to kind of see what's happening, um, but it contains this in a, in a very compressed format. Super sampling is where, um, you know, this, this image is uh, taken, this, this four by four uh, image, and we're, we're kind of running a, a kind of stride over top where uh, we're losing some information in the background. As you can see, it really blends together. But in the foreground, um, because we have more information in our image, um, we're able to have more information in our, uh, our final image. Um, so this is a very, very interesting phenomenon. There's a lot of literature out about aliasing. Um, it's a problem that's very prevalent um, in, in any signals problem um, and something that a lot of um, academia is, is covering. Um, so I'd highly recommend checking out some of these links. Um, this is a kind of fun demo um, that um, you guys could could try out. It's generating 8-bit music in C. Um, this is, is kind of uh, an, an add-on add um, to this presentation. It uh, doesn't uh, really contribute exactly to what we're talking about, but I thought this was incredibly cool. Um, with one line in C, you're able to, to generate melodies, um, which is incredibly cool. Um, yeah, so please check it out if you if you guys have a chance. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about briefly is geometric signal theory um, and specifically, you know, what a projection is, how it can be used to reconstruct signals, and finally, how that can tie in to reconstructing signals, right? Um, we, we are also going to talk about um, using deconvolutions. Um, we talked about the UNET architecture very thoroughly used for image segmentation. We talked about it in our survey of uh, computer vision techniques. Um, and this is, this is something that, uh, that is kind of going to come back in terms of how we can reconstruct signals. 
So the inner product and projections, right? Um, we know that the inner product measures similarity between two vectors, um, specifically, you know, if you have a vector X, a vector Y, um, zero means orthogonal, um, they're, they're very uh, dissimilar. Um, and a high value means that they're collinear, right? That they're, they're very similar to each other. Projections are an application of inner products um, where one vector can be projected onto another vector um, and you can you can kind of see what the projection is based on that. Um, the idea behind this is that uh, and and kind of con reconstruction in general is that if I have two uh, two vectors in the basis of a, a certain vector that I want to reproduce um, by using some linear combination of those vectors, I can reconstruct my exact signal. Um, given that these are uh, orthogonal vectors in the in the basis that I'm working in. Um, yeah, this just kind of walks through an example of projection. The projection formula is the dot product between X and Y. This is, I guess you could think of it as a similarity measure between these two vectors. Um, you're dividing this by the, uh, the norm squared um, and multiplying this back on X. Um, and through that process, you're applying a transformation that allows you to, to shift this vector by a certain angle um, and then rescale it onto uh, a given vector. So projections for reconstructions, right? Um, like I mentioned earlier, a vector can be reconstructed with a linear combination from its projections onto another set of vectors, if and only if the set used is a basis. Um, for those of you um, that have taken like Math 54, 16A and B, um, or X127, um, the basis is a subspace that's covered by all linear combinations of vectors, um, where the set of vectors, um, we can say S0 to Sn is called the span, right? Um, essentially, this is uh, a, a representation of all the vectors that can, can contribute to a, uh, a certain uh, vector combination, right? So by defining a subspace of uh, vectors, of certain vectors, linear combinations of these vectors can form any vector in the vector space that I'm interested in. Um, so given that a basis is required, the set of vectors used must be orthogonal to one another. Um, and this is very important um, as it ensures that we're, we're maximizing the amount of information gain, right? By having two vectors that are orthogonal to one another, um, we know that there is, isn't any similarity shared between these, right? Um, their, their dot product will be, uh, will be zero. Um, so for example, uh, these are two vectors whose dot product is zero, um, so that fits, um, and this really covers any vector um, in R2. Um, E0, uh, we can define as uh, one zero, so um, a horizontal vector, E1 is zero one, um, a vertical vector. Um, if we look at where we were trying to project um, some vector X onto uh, the, the E0 space, right? We can kind of see how the, the math works out here. So by applying this to the projection formula um, and solving out, we get um, x0, e0, right? Which is essentially x0, uh, 0, right? Um, given that we have we have no x1 component, um, when, we, when we do our multiplication out, the x1 component cancels out. The result of this, um, we can very, very clearly see with this example that when we're projecting a vector x, um, onto E0, we get X in the direction of E0, right? So we can see that this projection did work out um, as we're left with X, X0, 0, um, which is on the, the X axis, I guess you can say. Um, so we have X0 and only the, uh, the direction of, X, or the component, sorry, of X0 in the E0 direction. Um, this can be used um, to ultimately reconstruct a signal, right? So for example, if I have, you know, the same definitions of E0 uh, and E1 um, that form our, our basis, um, we want to take first the projection of, of X onto E0 and then the projection of X onto E1, right? We have no information here about what, uh, you know, like these, these components are, um, but by taking the, this projection, uh, onto uh, E0, we get X in the direction of E0, and we get X in the direction of E1. So by combining information that we have, right, these two are, are orthogonal to each other, right? They have no, uh, no shared information. So if, for example, we had a, a basis that spans um, multiple different um, uh, kind of spaces, um, and we had a lot of information, by taking the component of X on each of these bases that are orthogonal to each other, 
every time we take this projection, we're gaining information about the vector that we're projecting, right? And by, by gaining information on every, you can think of it, axis, um, we can ultimately reconstruct our original signal, right? So we know that x um, is equal to a combination of the projection of x onto E0, the projection of x onto E1, um, which equals these. Um, and this is defined as our, our total vector, right? x0, x1, where we have both components of our vector that we've recovered simultaneously by, by taking the projection onto um, our basis. Um, the result here is that as our, our basis differs, um, as long as these are orthogonal vectors and they span the complete uh, basis of a certain vector, we're able to reconstruct this vector. Um, the idea behind the, the last two sections here was to give you motivation for, for how signals work um, and how kind of classical reconstruction can occur using math that we're, we're all familiar with, right? Um, this, this makes a lot of sense and uh, kind of primes uh, the water for uh, what's coming next, which is a more machine learning based approach, things that we're more familiar with perhaps um, in terms of how we can use those to reconstruct signals and ultimately how we can use those to generate audio, right? Predict the best uh, kind of next node. Um, so looking at uh, kind of the next the next step here, um, we wanna use deep learning for reconstruction, right? Where we are, are reconstructing a, a low quality audio to a high resolution audio. Right, um, and this is this is the kind of uh, model framework um, that we can use for this. Um, you might notice it really closely resembles a UNet, um, which is something that we talked about during image segmentation um, and earlier on in the class. Um, a UNet can use a one D representation of a sub pixel convolution. This is a special type of of convolution. Uh, a deconvolution, sorry, a uh, layer that does the same operation as a deconvolution does, right? We're, we're essentially like upsampling um, and then it rearranges the pixels in a certain dimension. What this does is, you know, it increases the entropy um, and thus the information gain that we get from this operation, um, which is incredibly useful, um, especially in this scenario where we're trying to uh, kind of increase uh, the uh, the resolution of a, a certain low low quality image form. So as you can see, if this is our initial wave, um, our our final wave is is much more populated, right? We're able to gain information through this uh, this UNet process. So the way that this works is um, our downsampled waveform is is initially sent through uh, kind of eight downsampling blocks, right? That are made um, of convolutional layers with a stride of two, as you can see. Um, batch norm is applied. Um, we're using a ReLU activation function. And at each layer, the number of filter banks is doubled so that while the, uh, the dimension along the waveform is, is halved, the filter bank dimension is increased by two. You can kind of think of this like when we talked about the Swin transformer, right? As we intelligently combine these, these shifted windows, we're reducing the size of our, uh, of our image, but we're increasing the dimension the dimensionality of it. We're doubling the dimensionality as we're having the size. So we're not losing information, but we're developing a new representation of these images. Um, same here, we're developing a representation of these, these audio signals. So as we pass through the bottleneck layer, which is constructed identically to uh, a downsampling block, right? These connect eight upsampling blocks, which have residual connections to the downsampling blocks. You can see the residual connections here, right? What this allows you to do is it allows you to preserve features and share features that are learned from the low resolution representation of the image into our higher resolution um, output. So we have a downsampled block um, over here, which you know has the, uh, the eight convolutional layers, um, or sorry, eight uh, downsampling blocks. And we have the same uh, reflected over here um, in the upsampling blocks. Um, the upsampling, sorry, the upsampling blocks though use um, a uh, a subpixel convolution that we talked about earlier, um, where we reorder information along um, a certain dimension um, to expand um, kind of the information that we get. Um, the final convolutional layer um, has a, a restacking operation and it does the reordering operation following our our subpixel deconvolution. Um, we also um, are able to, to generate our upsampled waveform after this restacking step. Um, and the, the loss function used throughout this process specifically was, was kind of a mean squared error loss function. So by playing around with different kinds of, of loss functions, um, 
And uh, in this case, we're, we're just taking the mean squared error between um, the output waveform that's upsampled and your initial um, high resolution uh, waveform that, that we have um, as our, our training. So that's, that's the loss that we're considering. By improving that loss function, you might be able to yield better performance. Um, but that's what the, the authors of this specific methodology did. Um, I thought this was incredibly cool um, as it kind of, it parallels a lot of concepts that we talked about earlier on. Um, UNETs, um, the Swin Transformer, um, keeping residuals. We talked very, very, uh, very, very in depth about how residuals are able to um, kind of keep information um, across, solves a bunch of problems, vanishing gradients um, as your network gets bigger. Um, and you're able, you're able to, to use those in, in kind of reconstruction as well for audio, which is incredibly cool. Um, something else is that um, these, these kinds of techniques are used in a variety of ways to reproduce music from bands um, in, uh, you know, the 1900s, um, the late 1900s, the mid 1900s, um, whose recordings may not have been preserved in full quality. Um, so by, you know, through the remastering process, um, they're able to, uh, to kind of do things like this. Um, so that the listening experience for the end user is uh, is improved. So yeah, these are some of the results um, that uh, were were found from uh, this uh, this audio, um, where you have a true spectrum, um, and uh, you can see the waveform here. Um, this is the amplitude of the waveform over uh, time. The downsampled spectrum um, has you know you can see it's it's capped at a certain frequency, while the reconstructed spectrum after the passing through the unit um, has a lot more depth. Um, you're reaching higher frequencies. We're keeping kind of the downsampled um, spectrum that, that we know um, is, is accurate and we're able to kind of fill in the gaps in higher frequencies, um, right? Uh, the, the SNR signal to noise ratio um, goes down between the, the downsampled waveform and the reconstructed waveform. Um, as you can see, um, the reconstructed waveform matches um, the KVPS of the, the true waveform. Um, as uh, we're, we're, we're adding kind of clarity, we're adding color to our, our downsampled waveform to, to ultimately get something that hopefully resembles our true waveform better. All right, um, we're gonna kind of, uh, kind of transition now into transformers for audio generation, right? How can we use transformers to predict the next note, for example? Um, and uh, we're gonna go through this by looking at some considerations um, that uh, we've considered through uh, like image transformers, um, NLP transformers and things like that, right? So notes to a melody, right? We want to take notes and for example, produce the next note in a melody. We can use the transformer architecture to predict music notes. Our goal is to build a sequence model for music where we take an input sequence and predict a given target sequence, right? The two steps for building this model are kind of the same two steps that we use for any transform model. We wanna convert our data into usable tokens, which in the music realm does provide a different issue than it did for um, our other two uh, representations um, of, of image and text. We want to then build the model and train it to predict the next token, right? The first step takes the form of converting data, which is music files into a token sequence, which is individual notes, right? So eventually we wanna start with, with this um, kind of notes format, and we want to tokenize it into something that our model can understand, right? Um, this presents a unique problem that we're going to be talking about extensively. Um, but essentially, um, with with an image, for example, we talked about how, you know, you can, you can flatten your pixels, you have your pixel values, that's something that our computer can understand. Um, with text, using a model like BERT or something, you can create a 768 feature dimension vector um, that can be passed into to any models that you're training, right? Um, which captures information in a whole bunch of, of dimensions, right? Um, music is a little bit different. Um, and the reason for this is that there's a time series that you're not able to perfectly capture, right? What beat are my notes on? Is this an eighth note, chord note, half note, right? Um, what, what time signature am I in? There's a, a lot of considerations that need to be made. What key am I in? So the transformer music model um, is trying to do sequence generation through next token prediction, right? We have an end of sequence token um, and a beginning of sequence token, right? Um, so given a certain input, we want to be able to predict, you know, that this this will happen, um, and we we want to be able to get our our end of sentence token as well. Um, so going into the actual tokenization, right? Um, if we if we're tokenizing, for example, a sentence, we have our vocabulary, which you know we can easily map by a dictionary to certain keys. Uh, 
certain values where, where our key is our, our actual vocabulary and our, our value is associated with that. So taking text as a music model is like a language model. We can tokenize this into, you know, a series of tokens that all correspond to our vocabulary, um, which is very intuitive. What we can do for, uh, for music is we can approximate this, which is a series of notes in a piano roll, right? Or a, a graph that has our offsets and our pitches, right? So our pitches span, you know, a certain uh, pitch set. Um, and we want our, our, our information to be captured in multiple dimensions, right? We want the, the pitch of the note as well as the length of the note. For example, these two notes at the bottom, right? They correspond to, to E and A2. We want these to be half notes. We want them to last for half as long as our C4, right? Then we have, we have another note in the middle, um, which is, is going to intersect with um, the, the length of our, our bottom two notes. Then we're going to start new notes, right? Um, G and C3. Um, and we have an E note on top that also starts uh, at the same time. And that lasts um, two beats um, for, our, for our half note. Um, so yeah, these are all important considerations that we want to make. And these take the form of a piano roll, right? Which is a plot of frequency across time. Um, we know that um, a single music note is a collection of values. You can think of these as the different features that make up a music note, right? Um, the two naive ones that you can immediately think of are pitch and duration. Um, but this can be expanded into multiple things, right? Um, as shown, other attributes you can use as part of this are instrument type, dynamics, tempo can be used for a more complex representation. Um, taking something that is, you know, indicative of two features that represent music um, and really expand that into as many features as you think can, can positively contribute to the representation we're trying to form. Multiple notes can be played at a single point in time, right? This is um, polyphony, um, where you can have multiple notes, you know, intersecting each other. Um, we need to figure out how to tokenize this 2D data now, this, this representation into a single dimension to be fed into our transform model. Um, there is a simple representation of, of music notes, right? Where you have values and durations. So you just have a value and then you have a duration. Um, and this this is kind of a, a naive approach to to how we can represent a certain music note. Um, so yeah, there there are kind of different approaches we can use. Notes, which is one to many, um, where you have individual notes and you have many of them, where you're trying to encode a single note into a sequence of tokens, um, and combine the values into a single token, right? Where you have C chord note, D chord note, E half note, right? Which as you can see here, um, this kind of adheres to, you have, you know, two chord notes and a half note. And the tokenized form of this is you have C and then quarter D quarter E half, right? But the problem with this is that you have a large vocabulary size where you have to keep, keep track of all of these um, specific uh, kind of sub tokens where you have a C B mapped to a chord note somewhere else you could have, sorry, um, somewhere else you could have C mapped to a half note, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you have less control over predictions given that your vocabulary size um, will grow as you add notes, right? Um, the other uh, kind of thing is polyphony, right? Taking many notes and mapping it to one specific kind of tokenized set where you play notes sequentially if it's separated by a SEP, a separator token. If not, we want to play all notes together, right? So this keeps track then of where notes will start and end, right? We have a series of notes that we want to play together. Um, and then a series of notes, right? We have a separator token. Um, and then a, another note that we want to play, a separator token. And then another series of notes that we want to play, right? As you can see here, we have our... our start token um and then we have our our note here our note here our note here um d4 you know this is a quarter note d8 this is a half note it's double the length of a quarter note then we have our separating token right we want these to start together then we have our separating token and then we have uh and and 62, which is this actual note representation on a piano. Um, so we'll only have as many notes as, as on our piano, right? We're kind of uh, reducing our vocabulary. Um, instead of our vocabulary spanning um, each and every specific um, instance of a note, we have our vocabulary just spanning the notes itself. Um, and we're kind of, uh, we're tokenizing in this way where we have um, separator tokens, we have our start token, our end token, and we're able to capture information in a, a, a very um, sequential and very structured way. So putting this all together, you can get your initial translation, right? Where you have a, um, our, our initial translation 
was a translation from from this piano score um to this this tokenized form um which is is very very cool yeah um so the next thing um to kind of touch on is data augmentation right this provides an amazing data set multiplier to to simply get more data um, a single song can be transformed into 12 songs of different keys, which can help increase our sample of training data and generalize key scales and beats throughout a data set, right? The more data you have, the better your model will be and the more generalized your model will be, right? Um, we've talked about this thoroughly with images as well. Um, for images that are small, where you have a lack of information, convolutions outperform transformers. But when you have a lot of information, right? When you have a, a whole book that you're trying to process, um, as opposed to like maybe a single sentence, transformers will far outperform classical methods of, of both computer vision and natural language processing. Um, the more information you have and the more generalizability you have in your transformer, the better it'll perform, right? We talked about Occam's razor. We talked about how a generalized transformer, a generalized solution um, kind of can fit the Goldilocks of, of what we want in a model. It's easier for machines to predict keys without flats and sharps, um, which has, you know, similar to, to what humans do. Um, it's easier for us to focus on uh, the the regular keys on piano. Um, so this specific example is trained on, on those. Um, however, uh, the flats and sharps with specific augmentations and specific training processes um, can also be added in to our vocabulary. Um, so for example, um, this specifically, I believe this uses like a music 21 um, uh, framework, um, but it's able to, you know, tokenize um, a certain item. Um, and then you're able to transpose this to, you know, a certain, uh, a certain amount of notes, um, a certain key, and this is the, the transposed representation. So just by transposing, you're able to increase your, your training sample size, which is uh, very cool and can improve model performance by a ton, especially given that we're using transformers. Um, the next thing to consider is positional beat encoding, right? We want to include some metadata to feed into our model to give it a better sense of musical timing because the position of the token in our, our tokenized representation doesn't correspond to its actual position in time. For example, this is um, the same example where, where, where we have an item, we're tokenizing this, um, and this is the position of each token, right? But in reality, token seven is being played on beat one, right? The token at index seven is being played on beat one, and we want a way to capture that information, right? So converting notes to tokens isn't a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, if we want to send our model the beat that our, our music is following, um, we can include this as metadata along with the actual tokens to get more contextualized information. So now it no longer has to fin figure out musical timing on its own. It can now have some semblance of which notes are on which beat, right? Um, this is uh, this is very cool because um, it also parallels um, other concepts that we knew um, in terms of positional uh, structure, right? Um, when we were talking about um, transformers for natural language, right? Um, we were talking about how you know using some like sine and cosine functions, we can we can pass in information about the positionality of our text so that our transformer model has some semblance of that, right? Um, this is very similar um, except for music, um, which I, I thought is is very uh, interesting. All right, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is teacher forcing, right? So when training transformers, you want a way to mask information, right? You don't want to give the transformer all the information because then it won't really learn a, a very good representation of the data that you're providing, right? We want to be able to mask information that it previously had, as well as mask information that it'll have in the future, right? So we want to apply an attention mask to keep the model from peaking and essentially leaking information at the next token it's supposed to predict. We can do this by kind of observing this model, right? Um, so here, we at each at each step, the model can only see itself, right? At the first step, um, where, where zero is a token you can see, one is a token you can't see, um, which is a little backwards, I know, um, but you're, 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 you're essentially um, masking the every token except for yourself, right? Here, you're at the, at the next kind of step, you are able to see information you previously had and you're getting more information about the, the current token that you're on and you're masking everything that's, that's not the token you're on in the future. And by the last step, you're able to see everything, right? By applying an, a, another mask, a window of size two, here at the first step, you only see yourself, right? 
At the second step, you don't even see what token you're on. You only see the previous token. At the third step, you only see the previous tokens. At the fourth step, you also only see the previous tokens. So you're essentially enforcing a window size of two, where you're only updating the information you see, the prior information you see, every two time steps, right? At the very end, you can't see the final two bits of information. And that lack of information is very important to a transformer as it allows you to predict several steps ahead and will ideally produce a more generalized model. So this is a reverse teacher forcing where we're masking future tokens and potentially past tokens, depending on what window mask we're applying. Um, but yeah, this is, this is another way to improve model performance. And I think it's a, a very interesting concept. So going into the actual transformer architecture, um, this specific um, implementation used a transformer XL, which is a specific flavor of the transformer model. Um, this features, right, we talked about um, relative position encoding, um, as well as hidden state memory. Transformer memory, um, specifically to this model, enables very fast inference for music prediction, right? We've done a lot of things to optimize for, for our prediction. We're including a beat embedding, so that's not something it has to learn. We're including information about um, the, the tokens that um, you know, limits our vocabulary and captures all the information we want to have. Um, we're really only capturing two things. We're capturing the pitch of the note, um, depending on what note it actually is, um, and we're capturing the duration of the note. Instead of having to reevaluate the whole sequence on every prediction, you only need to evaluate on the last predicted token because of that information gained throughout the predictive process. Previous tokens are already stored in memory, um, and we're able to, you, you know, get a sense of, of relative position with Transformer XL, whereas vanilla Transformers will use absolution, absolute position only. Um, it's important for music models to know the position of each token relative to one another because positionality matters, right? The order that you're playing the notes really is, is what matters the most. And this is in additional to our positional beat encoding, which we're, which we're including for the, the, the model to have. Um, so I'd kind of like to end with um, a little demo generated by, by somebody um who who used this model um to kind of predict the end of canon in in d major by by paco bell um so the, here's paco bell's canon um kind of in the spirit of christmas coming up as well um Yeah, so as you can see there, um, this is the original Paco Balls Canon, and this is what's predicted, um, where these uh, little white and green uh, notes are the original Paco Balls Canon. Um, as you can see, this does deviate a bit, but honestly, it sounds pretty good. Um, so the transform model is able to uh, to kind of do this next note, next sequence prediction pretty pretty well, um, which I thought was 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 very very cool. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, a lot to do in this field, um, a lot of really cool things happening. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys learned something about, uh, about generative audio today um, and, uh, and are, are inspired to kind of give some of these things a try yourself. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Have a good one.